Welcome. In this episode, we're going to take a look at California's Lithium Valley. The term was inspired by California's Silicon Valley up north in the Bay Area. The term was popularized after Governor Gavin Newsom signed into law Assembly Bill 1657 on September 29, 2020, creating a Blue Ribbon Commission on Lithium Extraction in California, now called the Lithium Valley Commission. Experts estimate the region could satisfy up to one-third of today's global lithium demand. Governor Newsom's vision is that California becomes a global leader in sustainably co-producing lithium and renewable electricity from geothermal power plants. Planning workshops to gather input from local community members are already underway. Federal, state, and local agencies are teaming up with industry in pursuit of the vision. Lithium Valley is located at the northern end of the Imperial Valley along the shore of the Salton Sea. It's roughly 50 miles south of the town of Indio, which is located on I-10. We will now take a look at some local geologic features, geothermal operations, induced seismicity, and lithium mining. This map shows the San Andreas Fault, the Imperial Fault, and the Brawley Seismic Zone, which connects the two. Lithium Valley is located in the middle of the Brawley Seismic Zone. The Salton Buttes are located in the middle of the Brawley Seismic Zone. The Salton Buttes are volcanic rock that has risen to the surface and is connected to hot magma, which is shallow in the earth at this location. It is the high temperatures in the earth at shallow depths which has enabled the Salton Sea geothermal field to be developed at this location in the middle of the Brawley seismic zone. During a recent visit to Lithium Valley, I encountered a major detour along Highway 111 as I neared the town of Nyland. It turns out that the cause of the detour is well known and it's called the Nyland Geyser. Some reports say the geyser first appeared in 1953 after a 6.0 earthquake in the area. The geyser had been static and not moving for many years. The problem is that after a swarm of earthquake activity a few years ago, the geyser started moving and migrating towards the railroad tracks and the highway. In response to this geologic problem, both the railroad and Caltrans initiated some mitigation projects. Both the train tracks and the highway were rerouted and the railroad took some actions to try to stop the geyser from continuing its migration to the southwest. In 2008, the Nyland geyser could be seen located just to the east of the railroad tracks. In 2016, it could be seen that the Nyland geyser was still located in the same place. In 2019, the Nylon geyser can be seen to have relocated directly under the old path of the railroad. The view at the time shows the initial rerouting of the railroad to the west, and then the current rerouting of the railroad to the east around the geyser. In 2020, it can be seen that the geyser moved a little bit more to the southwest, and the preliminary detour for Highway 111 can be seen. Since 2020, the length of the Highway 111 detour has been increased. This is a close look at the Nylon geyser from the old Highway 111 roadway. Reportedly, the geyser is flowing about 40,000 gallons of water per day. The water flows into drainage ditches and or pools in the ground. Some of the water may evaporate due to the hot and dry climate of the area. Most of the gas coming up with the water is carbon dioxide. However, there is also some hydrogen sulfide which gives the gas a foul smell. The rerouted train tracks can be seen behind the geyser. Pipelines and telecommunication lines can be seen crossing the crater around the geyser. Reportedly, the temperature of the water is about 80 degrees Fahrenheit. 
This is a view of some of the mitigation work in 2019 when steel posts were being driven down about 70 feet to try to stop the migration of the geyser. The effort failed and the geyser ended up going underneath the steel posts. The location of the underground steel barrier can be seen in this view. Three wells were drilled in an unsuccessful attempt to stop the flow of the geyser. The rig used to drill the wells can be seen in this view. In this view, the large size of the crater can be seen along with the rerouted train tracks. One of the hazards associated with the geyser is the accumulating carbon dioxide gas inside the crater, which can cause an asphyxiation hazard. It turns out that the Nylon geyser is located by other features called mud pots in the area. This map shows the proximity of the Nylon geyser to the trend called the Worcester mud pot lineament. Studies have shown that the minerals associated with the mud pots can change over time in some cases. Some believe the Worcester mud pots line up with a fault. The fault could be the northern end of the Sand Hills Fault, which has been postulated to the southeast. It could be a new fault called the Worcester Fault, or it could be the southern tip of the San Andreas Fault. It could be an inactive fault, or there could be no fault at all. This map is from 1869 and dates eight years before the railroad connecting Los Angeles to Yuma, Arizona was constructed in 1877. The dry salt lake bed can be seen and some features known as mud volcanoes were placed on the map south of the lake bed. At this time, the valley was known as the San Felipe Sink, named after the creek in the area. This is an 1889 map of the railroad passing through the area. Very close to the location of the Nylon geyser, there was a railroad stop called Volcano Springs. The stop is shown as Volcano on the map. The map shows mud volcanoes and mud springs in the area of Volcano. Some newspaper articles at the time predicted that Volcano Springs would turn into a popular resort. In 1901, a drilling rig searching for oil about one mile south of the Volcano Springs train station had a big blowout. The rig was lost into the hole and the blowout was reported as a volcano. Steam blowing high into the air was reported. Around 1905, there was a huge environmental disaster in the area. Diversion levees had been constructed at the Colorado River near Yuma, Arizona, and a long canal connecting the Colorado River to the Imperial Valley had been constructed. Some levees failed at the Colorado River, and the entire river ended up flowing into the Salton Sink for about 16 months. And just like that, the Salton Sea was created. A large portion of the railroad passing through the area became flooded and had to be rerouted. The train stop called Volcano Springs was lost to the lake. And this map from 1908 shows the relocated train station called Volcano. By 1912, the lake level had started receding and a news report from the time mentioned a skeleton that was found in a pine box that was believed to be from the location of the old train stop called Volcano Springs. By 1914, the train stop called Volcano Springs was no longer mentioned. Promotional ads at the time compared the farming potential of the area to the Nile Delta in Egypt. To promote land sales, the land development company changed the name of Old Beach along the railroad to Nyland around 1914. This map compares old information with the more recent Worcester mud pot map. It can be seen that the volcano springs promoted in the 1800s directly align with the Worcester mud pots. 
This 1918 map shows the lake receded down to the level around the Salton Buttes, called the Obsidian Buttes on this map, and it shows mud volcanoes around the Salton Buttes. Nyland shows up as a well-established town, and the Worcester mud pots are not shown. This is a view looking north into California from the Gulf of California in Mexico. The end of the San Andreas Fault on the east side of the Salton Sea can be seen. And south of that can be seen the Brawley Seismic Zone connecting to the Imperial Fault. This cartoon shows the Salton Buttes at the south end of the Salton Sea. The volcanics have been injected upward in the extensional area of the Brawley Seismic Zone. Hot mud volcanoes near the Salton Sea have been known since the 1800s. In 1888, it was reported that the California State Mineralogist, Professor Hanks, fell through some crust and he became severely burned and ended up suspending his study of the mud volcanoes. By 1927, newspapers were promoting the mud volcanoes as a tourist destination. Articles included maps showing the mud pots next to Mullet Island, one of the peaks in the Salton Buttes. The Mullet Island mud pots are now known to be related to the Calipatria Fault, as shown on this map. The arrow indicates the location of the most commonly visited mud pots. This is the northeast corner of Davis Road and West Shrimp Road. Here's a 1956 map showing the Davis Road and West Shrimp Road mud pots at the same location. Some maps refer to these mud pots as the old mud pots, and this is how they look from the air. And this is how the mud pots look looking to the east from Davis Road. There are some no trespassing signs there, but there seems to be a well-worn trail. At this time, the mud pots closer to Mullet Island are inaccessible behind a locked gate due to a study of hazardous dust. Some maps refer to these mud pots as the new mud pots, and this is how they look from the air. In the 1930s, Mrs. Einhardt became interested in seeing what kind of gas was coming out of the mud pots. When she discovered that the mud pots in some areas contained nearly pure carbon dioxide, she became the inspiration behind a successful new dry ice manufacturing industry. In 1932, the newspapers had many reports of the newly discovered carbon dioxide field. The newly discovered field became known as the Imperial Carbon Dioxide Gas Field. A report published by the State of California in the 1940s showed steadily increasing carbon dioxide production rates and increased well counts into the years of World War II. The Imperial Carbon Dioxide Gas Field carbon dioxide gas wells can be found on old topo maps and they can also be found on this map of the Imperial carbon dioxide gas field published by the state of California in the 1940s. In 1933 there was a wildcatter who tried to expand the productive area of the carbon dioxide gas field into the area around the old volcano springs train station. The well was very close to the current location of the Nyland geyser and it resulted in a blowout that swallowed the rig. Needless to say, carbon dioxide gas production was never commercialized in this area. A street view looking to the east from Davis Road, about 1.3 miles north from the old mud pots, shows the remains of the dry ice plant. This area was flooded when the Salton Sea level rose a few decades back and then uh, has been abandoned since it receded. The old relics include some old power poles 
and some electric cable hanging from some of the poles. In addition to the remains of the old dry ice plant, the air view looking east over this site reveals the location of most of the old carbon dioxide wells, which now appear as craters. It should be noted that the first industry in the area was salt mining. In the 1800s, brine from shallow wells was pumped into salt flats and then dried in the sun. The salt was harvested, packaged, and shipped around the country. After the lake bed was flooded in 1905, most of the salt works in the area were abandoned. This geologic map, published by the state of California, show how the Salton Buttes volcanic rocks pop through the sedimentary rocks in the area. It is interesting to note that the Salton Buttes are shown as a volcano within the USGS Volcano Hazards Inventory. This cartoon cross-section shows that the Salton Buttes volcanic rocks are just the tip of the iceberg. Hidden below the surface of the ground is the connection of the volcanic rocks to the molten magna that is shallow in this area. It's these volcanic rocks that heat up the water in the overlying sedimentary rocks that the geothermal wells are drilled into to provide for steam production wells and injection wells. This was the view from the Obsidian Buttes to the southwest where a drilling rig could be seen drilling into the geothermal reservoir below. Modern geothermal wells are drilled and completed to very high standards. Steel casings and cement are placed into the wellbore to confine all of the produced fluids and injected fluids into the geothermal reservoir. The energy in the hot produced fluid is used to drive a turbine to generate electricity. Produced fluids, after they give up some energy, are re-injected into the geothermal reservoir and circulated through the rock to pick up heat again and to be produced and injected in a continuous cycle. The three major types of geothermal projects are dry steam, flash steam, and binary systems. Dry steam is when the steam coming out of the ground is just gas and there's no brine with it. This type of project is not present in the Imperial Valley. All of the Imperial Valley projects are either flash steam or binary. The large geysers project up in Northern California is a dry steam geothermal project. Since it does not produce brine fluids, the geysers project up in Northern California will never produce lithium. However, since it does not produce brines, the maintenance costs of the project are less as there is less corrosion. The dry steam comes out of the well and directly spins the turbine to generate electricity. The dry steam is then condensed and re-injected back into the reservoir to pick up heat and repeat the cycle. Flash steam projects produce the wet steam into a large separator in the separator, gravity separates the dry steam from the hot, wet brine. The hot, wet brine is produced off the bottom and re-injected into the geothermal zone. The dry steam from the separator spins the turbine to generate the electricity. Binary systems are used when the amount of heat produced from the geothermal well is not enough to produce a large enough volume of dry steam to spin the turbine to generate electricity. In binary systems, the produced hot brine from the geothermal wells is passed through a heat exchanger where it heats up a working fluid which then is passed through the turbines to spin them to generate electricity. 
Most of the successful geothermal projects around the world are located at plate boundaries where the hot magma is shallow and there are a lot of natural earthquakes. One of the potential hazards for geothermal operations in the Imperial Valley are induced earthquakes. Recent studies have concluded that a large earthquake that hit South Korea was caused by geothermal operations. Geophysics researchers at places like Stanford University have determined that in some situations, injection operations can induce earthquakes. In Texas and Oklahoma, it has become well known that injection of produced water associated with oil operations has led to a large increase in earthquakes. In Texas, to reduce the number of earthquakes caused by injection of produced water, the regulator has set up more stringent permit requirements. The approach taken by Texas has been successful in reducing the number of induced earthquakes. A 2013 study found that the volume of fluid extracted or injected in the Salton Sea geothermal field tracked the induced seismicity. These maps show on a year-by-year -year basis beginning in 2015 all seismic activity greater than 2.0 in the Imperial Valley. It can be seen that some years are more active than other years, and it can be seen that the activity often occurs in swarms. And in general, most of the activity is close to the geothermal wells. Most of the events are small and are not felt at the surface. However, from time to time, some of the earthquakes cause damage and they make the local news reports. Injection or production can induce seismicity in two main ways. It can increase the pressure within a fault, or the more common occurrence is to change the loading on a fault, either increase load or decrease load. This geologic map is published by the state of California, and it shows some suspected faults that underlie the geothermal wells in the Salton Sea geothermal field. The black squares on this periodic table of elements shows the top elements contained in the geothermal brine from the Salton Sea geothermal field. The Salton Sea field has a much higher concentration of lithium than the other fields like Westmoreland, Brawley, Heber, and East Mesa. Consequently, for now, the focus on commercializing the lithium extraction from the brine is focused in the Salton Sea geothermal field. There are new technologies under development and pilot testing to find the most cost-effective way to extract the lithium from the hot brine produced from geothermal wells and then to re-inject the brine minus the lithium. One of the projects at the Salton Sea made some news right after Joe Biden became president when they were awarded a $15 million grant from the U.S. Department of Energy for funding a geothermal lithium demonstration project. In October of last year, funding for the project was withdrawn by the federal government with no specific explanation. Last month, Tesla was in the news when they broke ground on a new lithium refinery construction project in Texas. The Tesla project is not a lithium brine operation. Instead, the Tesla project is a more conventional lithium ore refining operation, which is uh, how most of the lithium is refined in the world today. The Tesla refinery is being built in a port city, and this means that they can uh, import lithium ore from all over the world. This is an example of some lithium core samples drilled by a company exploring for hard rock lithium deposits in Brazil. After hard rock lithium ore, the second most common way to produce lithium is from salt evaporation ponds. 
South America has a lot of operations like this where brine is pumped from shallow wells and spread out in evaporation ponds and then once the salt is dry it can be harvested. The salt is then transported to a plant for further processing to remove the lithium. Mexico has very large geothermal operations to the south of the Imperial Valley and north of the Gulf of California. It is likely that Mexico has very different regulatory standards than California when it comes to geothermal waste. This air photo shows a tailwater pond that is collecting some concentrated brine downstream from multiple geothermal plants. This view seems to show some open canals transporting concentrated brine from multiple geothermal plants to the tailwater pond. Recent news reports indicate that Mexico is looking into technologies to extract lithium from its geothermal operations in Baja, California. <laughs>